really pleased that we can uh, materialise on this session. Um, I'm really thankful to our speakers today. Um, I'm just going to go around and have a quick introduction um, of everyone and then we're going to get started with the first speaker segment. Um, so, Samia, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so, my name is Samia and I am an artist and designer. <coughs> My name's Roland, and I'm just generally interested in tools for uh, lessening inequality. I'm James, I'm doing my PhD in English. Uh, I'm Nisha, and I uh, teach English and creative writing. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Ethel, I'm an anthropologist of the Turkey. Hi, I'm Naila, I'm working for Edexcel as a subject coordinator for English literature. I'm Awa, I'm an engineer, and I'm here to learn. I'm Ayan, I'm a science director, I'm a science editor. Yeah, sorry, I'm, uh, my name's Tukumbo and I'm sitting on this chair because I've got a bad leg. No worries at all. <laughs> Uhuru, my name is uh, Likai Kongo, I'm from the Uhuru movement. Thank you. Yes, Uhuru, I'm Alois Kinshasa, I'm the Secretary General of the African Socialist International, which is part of the Uhuru movement. Hi, my name is Nemekene Tundama and I'm a Colombian, so-called Colombian, um, anti-imperialist activists here in London. Okay, so um, firstly I want to thank our speakers, um, Brother Nemeken and also Brother um, Louise to uh, basically agree to speak um, here today. So Brother Nemeken is an anti-imperialist activist based in London, um, originally from um, is it Muisca? Muisca. Muisca territory, which is um, now known as Colombia essentially, um, is the co-writer of the We Are Latino. We Are Not Latino. Oh sorry, We Are Not Latino. Uh, we Are Not Latino um, and has organised um, history and political education classes for um, Nick and Tlaka, um, so-called Latinos for the last seven years. So Nemeken, if you want to introduce uh, your presentation. Alright, um, uh, firstly thank you to Nadia and, and the sisters who organised this uh, very important conversation that we need to all have on Fanon's work. Um, the, what I prepared today is, is on chapter three as, as, as it was organized, um, which is the trials and tribulations of national consciousness. Uh, what I've done is I've, I've gone through the chapter and I've taken out certain aspects that I think I feel are important to, um, to talk about and to make it relevant to what we experience here in London. Uh, so draw the parallels of, of what he's talking about in that in that um, in that time and in that region and make it relevant to what we experience here. Uh, so I'll just read out the these these certain points and then I'm going to do a, a very short analysis so that Brother Luizi can continue and then we can have a discussion. Um, so the first thing I, I took out was uh, he says. The settler bourgeoisie and the neo-colonial bourgeoisie think they can, they can become autonomous capitalist elites in and of themselves after direct colonial rule from Europe. But they soon realize that they must, if they, if they are to keep their position, cooperate with the imperial core, United States, Britain, Europe, etc. The economies that they build cannot be autonomous economies because, econ because uh, but economies which are at the service of the core. Therefore, the political and economic projects that develop can never represent the interests of the majority in the periphery re regions, but the minority who are an extension of the capitalist core. In other words, the local settler elites or the neo-colonial elites. Number two. So, so I've numbered these, so if, if you guys want to talk about a particular point that I've read out, uh, you know, just talk about the number and then I can go back to it. So number two is, Fran Franz Fanon calls them businessmen or intermediaries rather than cap captains of industry. If an, if an industry does arise, it's a, it's a primary industry at the service of the finished products industry in the core, therefore less economically powerful. This is also the argument of Rui Marini uh, from Latin America. So Rui Marini is very, very similar to Franz Fanon, but he, he talks about the conditions in Latin America. I think it's important to uh, talk about the two. 
Number three, the national bourgeoisie of the colonized nations bring, bring in support from the masses with empty nationalist rhetoric and slogans. For example, they talk about independence, but any detailed plan of what will come in the future is left unsaid. Number four, the elites back home sometimes call for the nationalization of the local industries, but Fanon says that this call is not about restructuring the economic system to make the profits from these industries available to the masses, but, a, but about transferring the ownership so that they may benefit, they may benefit from its profits. A change of hands rather than a change in who gets the wealth that is being created. These elites, since they are not interested in uh, number five, these elites, since they are not interested in securing a truly independent industry at the service of its own people, and who simply want to integrate themselves within the existing economic world system led by the West, have to be seen as neo-colonialists, as a class of people who betray their own in order to profit from the colonialist world order. Number six. Both the rural and urban bourgeoisie and colonized nations are interested in the profits they can rake from, uh, in from the world capitalist system and those profits are not then invested in the country's economy or its social infrastructure but transferred to offshore accounts or invested in prestigious cars, villas and toys for the rich. Number seven, Fanon points out that African men and women organize around slogans such as African unity which does put pressure in the colonialist system, but then once independence is achieved, this slogan, due to its vagueness, disintegrates and, and conflicts with the, African people's, um, with the African people's reality itself. In other words, vague slogans do have an important role in the struggle, but have to be accompanied by a clear program and a clear political line. Number eight. He says that the national bourgeoisie are concerned with immediate interest and therefore cannot see beyond their own noses. They are not interested in building a nation with a solid foundation. Number nine, when the bourgeoisie are fighting for power, they adopt slogans and speeches that are vaguely about liberation and freedom for the masses. But once in power, the bourgeoisie to see use, use these slogans as mere symbols. What is practiced is continued policies of mass oppression, exploitation, and poverty. Number ten, political education cannot mean a. And he says this: political education cannot mean a speech by a, by a political leader. It must be the organized education of the masses, so that they understand the political and the economic conditions of the country. So that ultimately they understand that if if there is progress, then it's because of them, and if there's stagnation, it is because of them also. The masses of colonized people need to understand that their destinies are in their own hands. So those, those are the 10 points that I, I took up from the chapter. And I'm just going to read out a quick uh, analysis of my own. Right, so how do we apply this chapter to our situation in London as exiles of colonized lands? Of course, we don't, we do not, we don't have a nationalist bourgeoisie per se. Being out of our own country means that our situation is a, li a little different. What we do have in our in our midst are non-white bourgeois integrationist leaders. The type that say our government, when referring to the politicians who executed the foreign policies that made us, uh, that made us end up here in the first place, or that say our country, although we have no say in running this country. They are nationalists to the colonial nation. Admittedly, many of us who use such language and who behave in integrationist ways towards the colonial nation have not had access to alternative ways of looking at our uh, situation. In my own experience as a so-called Latin American Colombian, most of the integrationists in my community do not set out to betray our people or to become servers to the capitalist imperialist interests of this country, but ignorance does not excuse us. Those of us who are aware of the capitalist imperialist structures of this country must do what we can to inform our community and organize against it. The nationalist bourgeoisie that Fanon speaks of in his chapter may not, uh, may not be fully aware of the complicit role they have in the global capitalist structure, 
but as our brothers and sisters in the Uhuru, in the Uhuru movement say, would say that it is a very convenient ignorance because they profit from it. Our role, if we are, jo if we are to join the ranks of revolutionary anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist, is to become aware of those structures and actively work against them. The active integrationists, much like Fanon's nationalist bourgeois back in the homeland, can be detected through analyzing their choice of words and in their future plans. If we are, to, if we are, to, uh, truly, if we are truly revolutionary, then we must talk about the dismantling of the global capitalist structures whose core areas can be found in Europe, and in the US. The integrationists on the other hand will not talk about anti-capitalism or and even less about anti-imperialism. They may talk about uh, certain issues that affect our community such as racism, uh, gender oppression, inequality, unemployment and so on which is important also. But they believe that these issues uh, can be solved by the, by the colonial nation without really rocking the global structure of capitalism. There are others who are unwittingly socialist in this country, but pro-imperialism in their worldview. They will protest and stand up for local injustices suffered by people here in Britain and London, but have not yet concluded that this country was built and is sustained through imperialist structures. I know some pro-Corbyn anti-Chavistas in my community. Of course, this is not to say that the local struggles are useless or that we should give up on trying to achieve any type of social guarantees here but it means that whilst we're trying to achieve these social rights right we must never lose sight of the broader anti-imperialist goal which is ultimately the liberation of the majority of the globe to conclude fanon very accurately describes an opportunist nation, national elite who use popular struggles to achieve power and prestige and who are ultimately dependent on the global structure of capitalism Many of us colonized exiles in London are either in a position to take a revolu revolutionary stance against the same global capitalist structure or to integrate ourselves into it and ignore the reality of billions of our people back home. We must then approach our, our activism as non-integrationist and revolutionary anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist. Uh, for some, this may mean that we sabotage our careers and our position in the society, but in the spirit of Fa Fanon, we must think about what's best for the majority of the people rather than for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, now again. Um, so our next speaker... Sorry, Ms. Barry. Luizzi Kinasa? Kinshasa. Kinshasa, sorry about that. Um, is the Secretary General of the African Nationalist um, Socialist International? Sorry, Secretary General of the African Socialist International, um, the worldwide organization of African People's so Socialist Parties, located in countries throughout North America, Africa, and Europe, and fighting for the total liberation and unification of Africa and African people everywhere. And you're from the Congo. Sorry, you can introduce yourself if you want to. Um, you're also part of the Uhuru movement. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Sister Nadia, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Louise Kinshasa, uh, born in the Congo. <coughs> I reside currently uh, in London, uh, in the UK here. And uh, I'm a member of the Uhuru movement. I'm a member of the uh, African People's Socialist Party. Uh, the way we organize, uh, we consider we consider uh, that the uh, UK is uh, what we call a UK front of the uh, African Revolution. Uh, we are not part of the uh, UK uh, Revolution, but we are the African uh, Revolution in the UK, so UK front. Just as we have the United States front of the African Revolution, we have the Congo front. The Namibia front, Zimbabwe front, the Senegal front, Brazil front, so on. And uh, all these uh, organizations of the African People's Socialist Party, each front, make up what we call the African Socialist International. And uh, I just want to <clears throat> say thank you to uh, Nadia and, uh, for your extending the invitation to us. And uh, I also just to extend my solidarity to Reverend McQueenie. 
because we consider <clears throat> the Africans and uh, the indigenous people of America and the oppressed people throughout the world basically are uh, the foundation upon which uh, UK, France, United States, all these countries uh, prosperity or wealth are dependent on. And uh, to talk about Fanon, uh, there's a lot of things to be said about Fanon. I know the chapter that's been given to me, depending on who you read, uh, the one I had is said a pitfall of uh, national consciousness. And I'm sure there are other books using different uh, titles. Uh, Fanon was what you call, uh, what you call the intellectual of the people. Uh, he was at the age of 29 or 28, uh, almost uh, what you would consider as the uh, elite uh, in France, where he was uh, a doctor and uh, he was uh, in charge of uh, a huge hospital at that young age. And uh, he had the whole, you know, colonial world. You know, he could have chosen that, but he didn't. You know, he uh, joined the uh, FLN, the uh, Front de Libération Nationale uh, of Algeria. And uh, not only he gave his medical skills, but also gave his political skills and the military skills. Because when he was 16, he volunteered to fight the uh, Nazi. Uh, because at the time he understood that. Uh, France was occupied, and as a French citizen, that I should defend France from uh, from Germany and, uh, occupation. So he also contributed uh, in that way. So he was an intellectual of the people. He was not the type of intellectuals uh, most of these universities would use most of the time. Those who think uh, just about their career, uh, you know, uh, they only think about themselves. But finally, saw themselves as saw himself as somebody who is there to solve the problem of the people. Uh, he was on the side of the people. He didn't join the colonizers, the oppressors. He said the role of intellectual is to be with the people. Give all the skills, all the knowledge you have, give it to the people because everything you acquire at university uh, belongs to the people. So I love him uh, uh, for that. And uh, in that chapter, what Fanon, Fanon, Fanon is trying to talk about is the role of uh, the petit bourgeoisie. He called them the bourgeoisie, the national bourgeoisie, but who movement, we call them the, uh, the petit bourgeoisie, in the sense that uh, the petit bourgeoisie itself is oppressed. Uh, basically, if you are in Senegal or in Zimbabwe or in South Africa, or even you are in the, in the US or in the, in the Caribbean, uh, there is another uh, bourgeoisie that oppresses uh, the whole uh, African population. So, we refer to the uh, African uh, bourgeoisie as African petty bourgeoisie. Uh, and uh, Fano talks about that. Uh, he also talks about the role of the party. What is the role of a political party uh, in the struggle against, uh, in the struggle for national uh, liberation? He also briefly uh, talks about the role of intellectuals uh, like uh, uh, himself. So there are many examples you can use, but generally speaking, is trying to uh, to show the limitation of the struggle for national liberation under the leadership of the African petty bourgeoisie because you have to be aware that all the struggles uh, in Africa, uh, I would say, uh, have been led by the African petty bourgeoisie. The workers and the peasants did not lead any struggle. I uh, do often hear people say, oh, what well, black people are doing? Uh, look, Africa failed and things like that. I don't hear people say, the African petit bourgeoisie has failed. No, the people, people never fail. Because people did not lead the struggle, didn't organize the struggle, but the petit bourgeoisie organized the struggle. So they failed. And, and finally try to explain why they failed. And uh, he, uh, I'll just read, uh, I won't do much reading because it will take more time, but I'll just read uh, this part. Uh, he's trying to explain, to describe the African petit bourgeoisie. Uh, this should be on page 82. Uh, he, he says, uh, since the bourgeoisie has neither the material means nor adequate intellectual resources, such as engineers and technicians, it limits its claims to the takeover of businesses and firms previously held by the colonists. The national bourgeoisie replaces the former European settlers as doctors, lawyers, tradesmen, agents, dealers, and shipping agents, 
for the dignity of the country and to safeguard its own interest. It considers it is duty. It, it considers it is its duty to occupy all these positions. Henceforth, it demands that every major foreign company must operate through them if it wants to remain in the country or establish trade. The National Bourgeoisie Discover its historical mission as intermediary. Our sub there. I finally describing the historical mission of the African people bourgeoisie as the intermediary class. Is the, uh, is the one who transmits all the values of imperialism to the people. Is the, the go between, the one who stand between you know, imperialism, is bourgeoisie, and the people. That's African people bourgeoisie. That's the African president, the African generals, the African chief of police, the African you know, uh, gen uh, general directors of the corporations, people like that. They are the one. And their job is not to free the Africa or the African nation. The free black does know their job. The mission, they use the struggle to negotiate uh, the transfer of power. That's what they did. Even when they picked up weapons, they did so to negotiate the transfer of the ad colonial administration. That's how you saw in South Africa. They transferred the colonial administration to the ANC of Nelson Mandela. Now they can you know, manage the, uh, the country. Nothing changed. The only thing that changed, now they don't live in the black areas. Now they move to the white areas. Now they can come to Europe. So, you know, visa is not a problem. But for the rest of us, visa is a problem, you know. So that's the African people who are They can buy houses here. It's not a crime. You, if the police stops, ordinary African workers in the, on the street of London or the United States, we fly. $2,000. Wow, where did you get this money from? You end up in jail. But if Zuma... So all these uh, African people who are leaders, Kagame, they can travel with millions and millions in their suitcases. They will open up the immigration doors. Come on, bring the money. You, you know, you're one of us. That's the job. That's what they do. They transfer all our resources and things like that. But of course, you don't hear the press saying that. The press says, well, Africa is corrupted. Of course, Africa is corrupted by the imperialists. That's the job of imperialists. You know, uh, something like that. So Fanon uh, talks about them. And uh, what I like about Fanon, he said, there is no uh, uh, yeah. there is no bourgeois development phase in Africa. He say that it's uh, impossible. So if you're dreaming of having an Africa that's free, independent, industrialized, developed in Africa, you're wasting your time. Under the African people bourgeoisie, it will never happen. That's what final he tried to tell us. He say not only is it impossible, it's see that social class, that social class is useless we don't need it you know when we wake up 50 years later to realize we have no moved up you know it will be without being you know wasting our time and final is trying basically to warn us about that it's a complete waste of time to have faith uh on Museveni, uh mobutu uh, you name them you know, you know these guys it's a waste of time and uh, that's one thing uh, Fano uh, is telling us, and uh, we agree with Fano. He's, uh, he's absolutely correct. And the reason is being simple, because uh, he did not give the, uh, the basis for that. But what we know is that uh, the bourgeoisie, what we call the bourgeoisie, you know, the, the class that owns this university, if it's not privatized yet, uh, all the buildings, the companies, the means production you see in the U.S. and France, all that, the bourgeois in the class, which overthrown uh, the bourgeois, uh, the nobility in France uh, and other places, was given rise by the uh, assault on Africa, the assault on the Americas, the assault on the Asias. Uh, it's a class that was given birth by the enslavement of Africans and uh, and uh, decimation, you know, genocide of the uh, indigenous people in America, that social class came to power with their wealth stolen around the world. It's not just they wake up one day, they've got a lot of money. No. Throughout centuries, they accumulate money that was not their money, the money that was produced by, just think about it, just get 100 people, you know, don't pay them for, what, 20 years? See how much money you will make. Now, if you think for three, four centuries, Africans will never go pay. So when you see Africans on the street, uh, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from all those places, they are the direct victims of the accumulation of capital that built England, that moved England from feudal 
the system to capitalist system. So that's how the bourgeoisie came into, into being. So for you to be uh, looking for a bourgeois development in Africa, you must also have what we call, you must have access to political accumulation. Where would you get that? So it won't happen. So the role of Africa and the role of African revolution is different. The role of Africa, the mission of Africa, finally didn't get to that, but that's for us, uh, <clears throat> our job is to take where final left off and develop from there. So the mission of Africa was to, to, to basically engage in a worldwide revolution that would destroy, that would end what we call parasitic capitalism, which means that you must go to the foundation of capitalism. And the foundation of capitalism, slavery and colonialism. The strength, the success of Apple, Microsoft, you name it, share all these companies. There is no magic. Their success depends on slavery and colonialism. You stop slavery and colonialism, you stop Apple, you stop Microsoft, you stop the United States, you stop the power of the bourgeoisie. It might sound simple, but that's how it is. And this is something uh, a lot of people, uh, <clears throat> the bourgeoisie, definitely understand it. The United States understand it. UK understand it. You can see UK has declined since it lost most of its colonies. You can see that. They lost um, uh, India, they lost, uh, of course, Africa changed from colonies to new colonies. But the power of England that has led to Brexit, you can link that to the loss of colonies. England doesn't control the colonies as it used to. So, uh, talking about the, uh, the work uh, of Fanon, he talks about the uh, necessity to bring uh, the masses to political life. Now we just throw slogans at the people, deepen the political understanding of the people. I'll give you one example. We all know this Brexit crisis, right? What does that mean for ordinary people? How do you, in British imperialism, is a crisis. How do you deepen the crisis imperialism? The job of the slave is not to save the slave uh, our masters. The role of the colonizers is not to save. No, the, the role of the colonized is not to save the colonizers. It's to get rid of the colonizers. Is that right? Just got the role of the oppressed Palestinian is not to save the settler uh, Israeli state. The role of revolutionary uh, Palestinian is to deepen the crisis of the settler Israel so that you can overthrow uh, settler uh, Israeli state. So the same British government is in crisis, just like the U.S. Uh, government is in crisis, the role of repression is deep in the crisis of Brexit. So what you do, you raise demands that allow the people to be on the offensive and to keep the imperialism on the defensive. For example, the British said they are in crisis, Africans should say, yes, you're in crisis, we want our wealth back, we want reparations. So reparation demand does not make Britain strong, it makes British government, British state weaker because they have to explain why they owe black people so much money. 100 years of unpaid labor. This has not been paid yet, so it's not finished yet, it's not over yet. Black people need their resources back. And this explains why black people are poor. Don't look for other explanation. We are poor because we have been oppressed and exploited for centuries and never got paid. It's simple as that. That's one thing. And uh, just like in the United States, you see the police shooting black people, so you're going to develop a domain that does not make the U.S. government stronger, but put them on the defensive. So you say, black community control the police. You don't talk about like Obama, you want all the cameras, that won't do anything, or you want a police review board, that won't do anything. You want the community to have power over the police. The black community must have power over the police. That's what Fanon is talking about. He say, deepen the political consciousness of the people, so the people can be mobilized, energized, and so they know the long-term uh, aims of the struggle, as opposed to dealing with spontaneous stuff. Because spontaneous stuff, that's not really deep in the consciousness of people. For you to hang on, to go for the fight to the finish, you must have a deeper consciousness. If you don't have it, you won't hang around too long. At the first difficulty, they disappear. You don't want to fight. But someone will understand that freedom means control you know, for us, it means control over our lives, control, control over the police in our community. We know where the police reside, where it lives. Uh, we have the right to hire and to fire the police. This way, the police won't be going around shooting people the way they do it. Because you got the right to do what? Hire the police and fire the police.
But if the right to hire and fire the police is in the hands of the people, is in the hands of the police themselves, then they will do the hell they want to do. That's what's happening everywhere. Just like it happened in the US, it happens here too. So fun and really is critical about that. He said the role of the party is not to transform itself to a, a state. Most of the political parties in Africa, they are also the police. They are there not to educate the masses, but to snitch on the people. Who is against the boss here? No, who is against the leader? Who is against the party line? He's against the party line. Forget his name. You won't get a job tomorrow. Or they give you hell at work. Or someone comes at night and arrests you, burn your house, things like that. The role of the party is to deepen, develop the understanding of the people. Not to become, not to contain the people, to make sure the people don't move, don't develop. That's what political parties do in Africa. And, and, and that sometimes when the political parties led the struggle for so-called independence, they are even more vicious. Because they keep saying to you, you are independent because of us. No, the people sacrificed. You remember how many people died in uh, South Africa, in Zimbabwe, Congo? How many people died? Lots of people died. They committed, you know, sacrifice just for the struggle to move forward. But what you see are uh, the parties, because those parties were created by the African people bourgeoisie. They were not created by the African working class and poor peasants. And therefore, as Fanon said, when they uh, have access to the state, when they became managers of corporations, that's it. For the African people bourgeoisie, that's the end of history. Anything else is illegal. Anything else, you uh, you become like uh, this is what they use. You uh, I can't say security leader. How do you say that? They say something like you are a danger to the security of the state. Just because you you say no, no, no. What kind of independence is this? Most of us continue to live on less than a dollar a day. You know that. In Africa, most of the people live on the less than a dollar a day. And we can do nothing with that. So if you want to struggle, they say, no, 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 no. You can't struggle for national liberation. You've got to struggle against corruption. Which is, corruption is a symptom of neo-colonialism. Corruption is not the beginning, it's not the starting point. The starting point is the foreign domination of Africa. That's the starting point. That's what Fano's talking about. Our raw material, you the price are fixed by the imperialists. We don't come to London or go to Wall Street uh, in, a, in, a, in the United States or go to La Poste de Paris and say, this is our goal, we fix the price, this is our goal, we fix the price. We don't. They fix the price for everything Africa produces and Africa sells. And that is the problem. This is called colonialism. It's not racism, it's colonialism. It's a domination of Africa, military, economic domination of Africa by imperialism. That's what uh, uh, we are, we are up against. And uh, Fanon also basically talks about the uh, necessity to build, uh, when you're talking about the youth. Uh, he said uh, that's something that's happening now. Africa needs youth who have consciousness, as opposed to just developing sport people. If you develop just sport people, what are you going to have? You're going to create mentality of footballers you have here. They're just footballers. Everything else is not a business. You know, I'm just here to play football, I love football. No. Everybody must take position in the struggle for national liberation. You can't be a spectator. That's what Fano is saying. Fano is saying, if you are, that's the choice. You are a coward or you're a traitor. If you say you are neutral or you are a spectator, that's the position of Fano. He said, you cannot be neutral because how many times you talk to people, sport people, young people, whoever, Oh, I'm not into politics, I'm neutral. You can't be neutral. You either for national oppression of Africa or you're for or you're for national liberation of Africa. You either take position against the oppressors or you're for the oppressors. It's simple as that. You can't be neutral. It doesn't exist in a world split between oppressor nations and oppressed nations. You can't be neutral. And that's another point that Fanon is making. So he say the youth needs police education, they need consciousness, then they can be sport people. Not the other way around. And that's what imperialists are doing. They're building football academy throughout Africa, you know, young people telling them to be sport people. And they will, you know, they will just end up being the pawns of imperialism. Because imperialism needs not just the politicians, they need footballers, uh, uh, musicians, you know, artists who can also be the transmission belt of imperialist values. And Fano talks about that. So there are a lot of things to talk about. I can just conclude here. Basically, Fano uh, died, he cannot develop. But he's trying to 
to so that we basically uh, I, I'm not say two things but two uh, big points one is the question of a national liberation it didn't define what is the African national liberation it was talking, it was talking in terms of context of uh, countries defined by Berlin conference so you could talk about Algeria, Senegal, things like that we don't talk in those terms we said Africa lost its freedom not as a, compact, uh, a fragmented uh, uh, entity. We lost our freedom as a people. Africa came under assault. So put this away. Black people have lost the freedom because Africa lost the freedom. Does it make sense? So it's not one part of Africa. The whole of Africa came under attack from 1415. That's the first uh, assault that came I want to say the first of all, I mean, this system of fascist capitalism, the way it was given birth to, started by the Portuguese capturing what they call today Ceuta, uh, I'm not sure you pronounce it, but it's in, uh, of, um, of Morocco. And that was in August 1415. And then they reached a place like Congo by 1842. That's 10 years before they attacked uh, the Americas. And, and the Pope, intervene and said all the land uh, acquired by the Portuguese, you know, is basically legal. The Pope, so you can say that you need to go to Africa to explore, but they start going to Africa to capture land and capture the people. Uh, you can say already by 1482, Africans have been captured already and put in slavery uh, in one of the Portuguese islands, and that was before they went to America. So they were on a mission to explore. So that trajectory, when they hit Americas, later on Asia and other places, it's that process I'm talking about that create what we call the world economy of today. So the struggle is happening in that context. That's what we're saying. The struggle for us is the struggle for the free African nation. When I say the African nation, we mean not just Africa and the black people are also outside Africa. The Fiji, New Caledonia, other places, India and places like that. And we also mean Anybody who also lives in Africa who is not black can also be part of the African nation. That's why our struggle is not against racism, our struggle is against colonialism. There's a difference. If you fight against racism, you will never know when you, win, when you have won. Can you tell when you won? But if you fight against colonialism, you can tell when you won. When Africa is free, united, and under the leadership of the African voting class in alliance with full present, you can tell we have won. We have our own state, things like that as opposed to fighting against racism, which basically ideas in the head of white people. We're not trying to change the ideas in the head of white people. We're trying to win white people to stand in solidarity for our struggle against colonialism, as opposed to fighting for acceptance, with you know, white people to accept us, integration. We're not fighting for that. We're fighting for power over our own life. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. We're fighting for power. So if a white person likes me or loves us, you must love us to have power over ourselves. And it should be prepared just as I am to fight to the death for us to be power, to have power over our lives. So I'll stop here so I can see that's my time's up. No, if you have any concluding points. Yeah, basically, uh, that's basically what I, I, I was trying to conclude. The question of a nation has been developed. It's not a question of freeing a single, uh, it's not, the struggle is not about separated countries in Africa, freeing themselves separately, it won't happen. There will be no freedom for like uh, Senegal by themselves or Trinidad by themselves. But the freedom must happen within the context of the African nation. That's, you know, that's what we're fighting for. So everyone, that's what we're talking about, the front. Trinidad front of the African revolution. And by saying that also, the African nation can only be given birth by true revolution. Because the working class, the African working class can only seize power through revolution, not through election. We are not against election, but just to be clear, it has to be through revolution. And the African revolution, what it will do, uh, it will also uh, create the conditions for the fall of the white nation. What's the white nation? The white nation is a bourgeois nation, right? And the bourgeois nation is what? The bourgeois nation is what? It's an imperialist nation. It's an aggressive nation. It's a warmonger nation. It was born on a genocide. It, it requires wars against all oppressed people all the time. So the, the, 
the, the white nation, being a bourgeois nation, has to be overthrown if you want to see peace on the planet. You can't have peace on this. It's impossible to have peace on the planet as long as the white nation exists. Not because uh, we put it this way. What the humanity needs, it needs the end of a relationship between oppressor nations and oppressed nations. If that dichotomy, that you know, uh, division is ended, then there is no basis for the white nation to be a bourgeois nation. It has to be a nation of workers. Work like everybody else, without oppressing anybody else, without stealing resources from anybody else. And that only can happen if the nation upon which the white nation sits up overthrow that. So the indigenous nation is at the pedestal. The African nation at the pedestal. The oppressed nations in Asia, all the, in the Middle East, we are all the, what we call the pedestal. So the white nation, the Bush nation, sits on all of us. So if you want peace in the world, and the wars, you have to overthrow that. If you overthrow that, then there is no basis for the white nation to exist. Because for the white nation to exist, it has to be a bourgeois nation. And the bourgeoisie does what? Does colonize everybody else. Does oppress everybody else. That's why you can't talk about stuff like racism. People talk about colonization. That's the issue. Racism is a distraction. It doesn't deal for colonization. And that's some of the things we have developed from where Fanon left. Because Fanon died young. He was 35 years old. He didn't have time to, to sum up what he has learned. 35 is nothing, you know. And uh, our movement has been around long enough, 40 years of existence. So we have drawn from all these uh, experiences. And we're saying now the world is in a better place. Today, the crisis of imperialism is their crisis. And it's caused by the struggles Fanon was a part of. Don't let anyone fool you, the crisis you're looking at is the crisis caused by the accumulation of success of the struggles of the oppressed people. People in Algeria, that struggle, put France in crisis, and France never recovered from that crisis. England was put into crisis by the struggle of the Mao Mao, of Kwame Nkrumah, all these uh, in India, all these places, and Britain never recovered from those crises. So what you're looking at is a maturity of the crisis. The crisis has matured, but what is missing the oppressed people ourselves are not aware of it, are not conscious of it, because we, we have been told for so long we are insignificant in the world history. We are not. We are the leading force for the, for the transformation of the world. And that's what we need to understand and uh, be more uh, uh, bold and organized and uh, move the process forward, because the world has to get rid of uh, of white power in the form of the bourgeois nations. It has no purpose apart from oppressing and killing wars and things like that. If, if, even, even the seas, they have enough of the bourgeois nations. They destroy everything. It's like Columbus said when he went to America, it was like heaven when he was in Haiti. Haiti is heaven today. Who wants to live in Haiti today? They destroy Haiti. Everywhere they went, they destroy because colonization, loot and loot, oppress. You know, she should begin to talk about the crimes France has committed and the British uh, imperialists has committed it, or US imperialists has committed. It would take us days and days and days. Uh, but finally, we are in a better place today. As I say, it's just a question now of people becoming conscious of it. So our job, particularly you students, young people, to understand that the future, your future, isn't in, in the revolution. Your future is not with imperialism at all. Imperialism has no future. And why people should not be scared of a revolution? They should love a revolution. They should love anything they want to destroy by a power. Should, they should love it, should not embrace it. And that's basically what, basically, why people have to rejoin humanity. Instead of being self imposed e exile, instead of fighting to save the dolphins. Save, save the rainforest, things like that. No, the struggle is and imperialism. And that is the theory. If you haven't heard of that man, it's called Omali Yeshidela. And uh, he wrote uh, this, uh, what's that book? This is the book. That's the book I recommend everyone should have. If you haven't read that book, you're missing a lot. You want to understand what's going on until you read this book. This is the book that sums up the crisis of imperialism. And uh, I can tell, I can read something to you if I have time. Uh, 
he wrote something here in a I don't want to waste time because I still have marks because it's not a book I have. Oh, it should be here. So here, he wrote this passage I want to read in 1981. Some people were not born here. 1981, just to show how relevant he was. He said, the U.S. is the sharpest manifestation of dying imperialism in the world today. But any discussion of the weakness of the U.S. and Western imperialism must be taken out of, of the abstract. Its metaphysical, one-sided character must be destroyed if this discussion is going to serve us, if it's going to deepen our understanding of the world and inform our practice. In the first place, U.S. and Western imperialism is not simply dying or weakening on its own accord. It's not accommodating us by committing suicide. U.S. and Western imperialism is being weakened, it's being killed. The present world situation ought to be enough to convince the most opportunist doubting Thomas of the centrality of the struggle for national liberation to the destruction of imperialism. For it's clear that the present crisis of imperialism, as in the past, is being caused by the defeat of imperialism, by the struggles for national liberation and independence. The U.S. and Western imperialist empire builds and sustains even now, by the primitive accumulation of capital, the theft of land and resources from the oppressed people of the world is being shaken by the continuous struggles of the people to reverse the verdict of imperialism. To take back what is ours and to use it for our own benefit. From our perspective, it's not enough to simply state that imperialism is dying, that the US world power is declining. We must understand that we are winning and we must convey this understanding to the masses of our people and we must escalate the process. The present crisis of imperialism that reveals U.S. weaknesses was brought on by the success of the Iranian people in casting out the Shah of Iran. Before that, it was the victory of the Ethiopian people which caused the crisis. Before that, the victories in Angola and Mozambique. In addition, there have been the victories of Vietnam and Kampuchea, the OPEP, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, Alignment, we challenge the U.S. and Western imperialist energy monopoly along with Cuba and Chile, Korea and China, Afghanistan, Laos and Nicaragua, etc. etc. And uh, much go along, but that's really it gives you the essence of what I'm trying to say. That's H1, but the book was written uh, uh, two years ago. So it's an update uh, of that and the deepening of the crisis being summed up and what the tasks of us the living is today. And we should not be in despair, we should not be panicking, and we should be uh, in full spirit that the world is about to change. But we have to know what our tasks are. That's the problem, and particularly for young people. Why are the British government scared of debates in universities? They're using so-called jihadists to say you can't come to university to debate. In universities, they love ideas. They are scared of jihadists to come to university to discuss. What's that? It's a weakness because they cannot win the arguments, even against the jihadists, I suppose. They can't win the argument. Uh, the imperialism finding it difficult to defend itself and they have to hide. That's why they're hiding in the face of Obama. Obama is not the face of uh, imperialism originally. Obama faces the face of the oppressed, is that right? Black people are the face of what? Oppressed people. Suddenly, the face of oppressed people is in the White House. Why? Because the imperialism cannot hide in its own color. So it has to hide in the color of black people to confuse the whole people. Just like when Obama went to Cairo, he said, Salam Aleko. That was to confuse the people that he was a friend of the oppressed. He wasn't. Because imperialism is imperialism, even when it comes in the form of blackface. As the chairman says, if imperialism can hide as an Eskimo, it will hide as an Eskimo, but it will still be imperialism. So just uh, at the end, we are in the right time in history. So you just, as Father say, the role of uh, young people out of, uh, of relative obscurity is to discover the mission. When they discover it, it's up to them fulfill it or betray. That's what Fano said. And he was right. That is the decision is yours. If you want to fight for a new world where there is no slave and a slave master, there is no boss and workers, there is no oppressor nation and oppressed nation. There is no oppression for women. 
it's up to you. You know, if you want to be like a father, right on. The future is ours. They take the future. Or, um, for that contribution. So we were wondering, um, would you like to kind of share your thoughts on the chapter or can we dive in with some questions? Um, does anyone have any um, sort of, yep? Uh, there's something that I'm interested about in um, phenomenal socialism. Like earlier you mentioned, for instance, the example of people who support Corbyn over here. And they have this attitude of like, uh, oh, can we not talk about colonialism? Can we not talk about race? You know, like, let's focus on the class war and let's, you know, yeah. like put all our differences and like focus on that. And I wonder when Fanon kind of places this problem of, you know, like national liberation in the terms of uh, like a national bourgeoisie and uh, but, like ignores that a lot of like colonized countries do their own colonialism as well. Like, for instance, like a lot of colonized countries themselves, you know, they do their own colonialism that's independent of the kind of working class bourgeois relationship, like ethnic colonialism. You know. And for instance, like in China, in China, the Chinese government, you know, the Chinese economy is growing like really fast and uh, they seem to be kind of scoring some kind of a victory against, you know, colonialism and it's like exploitation of resources, like direct exploitation of resources. And uh, the Chinese government is, you know, using this rhetoric of like nationalism, or actually even in Turkey where I come from, you know, like the uh, party that's in charge, they're really good. Like even me, sometimes I fall for their kind of like anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist rhetoric, because they do that quite well every now and then. Like every now and then they just get it right, and I'm like, yeah. But then like they turn around, and the biggest problem that they do is like their internal co like colonialism, which in Turkey is against Kurdish people and there is kind of like in colonized countries, colonized countries that were colonized by Europe, US, whatever, uh, not only do we have I believe like a problem of like class, of like the, exploit uh, the use of the bourgeoisie by the colonial powers to like you know uh, keep doing it, uh, but there's also kind of like an ethnic aspect to it as well and I'm asking the question because like at what point does embracing socialism within that kind of liberation movement makes us like Corbynists, you know? Like, at what point do we end up being kind of like, hey, you know, like, make, like, you know, like a Chinese person saying to like a Chinese Muslim, hey, you know, like our government is like really scoring a goal against the Western imperialists right now, maybe you should put your ethnic or like religious thing behind, because like, also it's a very socialist country too, like, we need to have this like proletarian unity, against both Western imperialism and colonialization by, you know, like, bourgeois powers. Like, at what point do we start to sound like a Corbynist when we start to kind of, like, embrace this ideology of socialism against colonialism? At what point does that make us say stuff like, hey, you know, I don't see color, or we all sure, bleed sure, red? Sure, sure. Uh, if we get to talk, if we, let's talk about Corbyn first. Uh, Corbyn is a member of the Labour Party, right? As far as, no, he has no resigned from the Labour Party. And the Labour Party is an imperialist organisation. It presides over imperialism. Just go and talk to your right. I don't care if it's a player, is a leader of it, or Corbyn, uh, Jim Corbyn is a leader of it. And uh, if you're for socialism, means that uh, you are for the colonised people to be free from colonialism. And uh, in the case of uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, or the Labour Party, or white people in general, the first uh, Thing they have to do is to be in the solidarity with the national liberation struggle for all colonized people unconditionally, and that means uh, uh, recognize the demand for reparation. Like my brother here from Colombia, he has the right to demand reparation from the oppressor white nation, regardless if you're in power or not, regardless if you're Labour Party or Tory Party, regardless because the uh, resources and the labor of the people of so called Colombia, because Colombia is an, is a, is an insult to call people from that part of Colombia. Colombia was a pirate. You know, who initiated that genocide in the first place, so you can't call them like property of Columbus. So they have, they have to pay reparations, just like for Africans. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, for him to be uh, on the right side of history, must unite the demand for reparation. Now, in terms of socialism, you see, there is uh, people uh, from what people know uh, is that uh, socialism is supposed to be something that ha is supposed to happen in Europe. The white working class is supposed to have overthrown 
the white bourgeoisie and they'll become the rulers. That's what is supposed to happen. But it didn't even happen there. What happened is the Russians, the socialists and the Russians, seized power. But even for them to seize power, it was a, a struggle. They say socialism should not happen in Russia. It should happen first in so-called advanced countries in the West. England, France, Holland, and Germany, and things like that. It didn't happen. And uh, Lenin came with uh, an explanation. He said Russia was the weakest link. But that's not really the issue. The issue was for socialism to happen, slavery must end. For socialism to happen, the relationship between colonized nations and colonized nations must disappear. Or Russian became socialist, China became socialist, and so on. But colonialism or slavery remained. Africa still. Uh, oppressed, people in Latin America are so called Latin Americans are oppressed, so in the Middle East and so on. So the struggle for socialism must be laid at the pedestal of basic capitalism. <coughs> that this makes sense. For us, for socialism to happen, put it this way the main contradiction in the world is not between the white working class and the white bourgeoisie. That's not the main contradiction in the world. The main contradiction is between the colonized people and the colonized nations. Does this make sense? So, let me just finish. So, if you want to see socialism, if you want to see socialism, you must overthrow that relationship. And that struggle has to be led by colonized people. That's why we say the struggle for socialism is painted black because you cannot have socialism, you can't have two systems. You either have Pastist capitalism or you have socialism. But the socialism that happened in Russia did not destroy Pastist capitalism. Why? Because, because capitalism was not built at the expense of Russia. Does this make sense? Capitalism was built at the expense of all best people of the world in Africa, in the, in the Americas, in the Middle East, in the Asia, and so on. So if you want to see socialism, you must first get rid of Basis capitalism. And that is the struggle of the colonized people. And their struggle must be led by the uh, African working class. And finally, you made a point, ignore racism, ignore colonialism, let deal with the class war. The struggle against imperialism, the national liberation struggle, is the class war. Because what you have, you have you got a, a dividing line. The oppressor nations like England, they were contradiction inside England, right? So you have the working class and the bourgeoisie of that oppressor nation. But the struggle of the working class in England, like in France and other places, with their bourgeoisie depends on exploiting the rest of us. So when the work is gone, the strike here of the trade unions, they're fighting to share the loot of the world economy, which greatly come at the expense of those who are paid less than a dollar a day. That this make sense. So when you say the class struggle, they ignore the national, uh, the colonial struggle, and uh, the, um, what do you say? Ignore the, uh, I forgot exactly what I said, but basically, the point was the, the class struggle is concentrated in the colonial question. So I'm fighting colonialism. So I'm fighting the black petty bourgeoisie. I'm also fighting the white bourgeoisie, the white imperialist bourgeoisie. So when the workers, when the poor people fight, they're fighting all oppressors, including their own oppressors. But when the white working class is fighting, it's not fighting to destroy. They are bourgeois, they're fighting to negotiate more rights. Does this make sense? They fight for rights, for the share, for peace between them and their oppressors. But we, the slaves, basically the colonized, can't find peace, can't find happiness until the system is overthrown. And that's the difference. And that's, this is a massive difference. And that's what we're saying. George, Jeremy Corbyn, the white workers must join our struggle to end imperialism as opposed we 
joining the struggle to share the loot from imperialist exploitation of the vast majority of the people of the world. Does it make sense? Yes. But join our struggle under our conditions. Under our leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Under our leadership. Can I ask brother here to... Um, I believe that it's not actually a religious conflict, to be honest, region. I don't think it is a um, an, uh, sort of religious conflict. I would say it's very much an ethnic conflict and it's like an ethnic um, nationalist kind of movement where they just want um, separatism from, from the Chinese um, na national state nation state so if you can kind of comment on because you can relay that really um, across the across the, I mean even in my own kind of ethnic group so for example you've got like ethnic um, divisions after the colonizers um, so, so like the Soviet Union occupiers who left my land and then what happened was um, a civil war amongst eth ethnic groups essentially so there, there is no unity there's no kind of organization um, amongst our own people do you know what I mean so if you can comment on that I'm not too familiar with the case that you mentioned in, in China, but um, the the example that I can give of a working, uh, a socialist country that is, is working to to uh, solidify the nation without oppressing the different cultures and different ethnicities within it, uh, Bolivia is a good example, where Bolivia um, are... I wouldn't say it's. I wouldn't say it's uh, socialism as what, what we're, the ultimate socialism that we're fighting for, but it's, it's heading towards towards that. And and they respect the, the ethnicity, not just in not just in name, but also through their policies, which is distributing, redistributing the national wealth among among them, making sure that they, their rights are respected. Um, they, they even changed the name of the country to. Uh, Plural, plural something of Bolivia to show that they was they're one nation but they respect the different. Um, so that is the socialism that we should be fighting for. The, the, the type of socialism that is, accepts that there are uh, different ethnicities and cultures and, and religions etc. Yeah, um, sorry there was a lady just here um, who wanted to make a comment. Um, uh, yeah, feel Obviously, um, just met the lovely lady over here and just through like a conversation it just so happens that you know she said we're discussing for now my PhD research work at University of London is actually and that's what I've just been doing right now editing my chapter so two books on for now so um, basically one of the issues that we're just talking about in terms of the class struggle where we look at how the nations of the world are supposed to unite that also, if you're familiar with um, Jean-Paul Sartre, Black yeah. Orpheus, okay, that is exactly what Sartre was actually talking about when he kind of questioned the whole idea of, um, you know, uh, the, the, the whole um, issue of oppression of especially, um, you know, the colonized. Um, basically, like we reiterated, Sartre was saying, obviously through Black Orpheus, that First of all, for even the black man, you know, or black people to even become aware, you know, of how to struggle against the capitalist um, regime, which is basically where everybody, you know, black, white, you know, whatever, we're all victims. But what I would like to say is that, first of all, it is important for every individual to be, on, to be aware of their own culture. You know, if you're not conscious about your own self, you know, because what was taken away in the first instance, the whole idea of the colonial, you know, when colonialism came, the objective of colonialism was to obviously come in and, you know, take over the land, restructure the whole, you know, um, colonized countries. But the first thing they did was to kill the culture of all the nations, you know, the, impose a Western idea. You know, so socialism, capitalism, when we actually talk about this, we're using Western concepts to actually find ways of struggling. So when you're kind of using those kind of, you know, ideologies in itself, that in itself is quite questionable. But that's okay if you understand your own culture. The first thing is that every colonized nation, like Fanon said, suffers from an inferiority complex in the first instance. Our own languages 
whether you're Bolivian or Turkish or I'm from actually from Nigeria and part Nigerian part Ghanaian and a lot of um, you know colonized people you know begin to struggle and they don't even understand that first of all to have your own identity in itself be proud of who you are you know even if you're going to speak or you know um, use the kind of I mean, you know, those of us in the diaspora have now obviously taken the language of the colonizer, of the colonizer, you know, but we still have to have the underlining issue of our own, you know, culture, who we are, you know, what I mean, and that history of colonialism. Once we get that and we become conscious of ourselves, you know, in our own, you know, to be who we are and proud of who we are, then we can now start taking on you know, all these other issues about, you know, class wars and race and all that, where basically those issues become non, you know, that's where, you know, those issues like race become, you know, eradicated. We're all sitting over here right now, as you can see from different countries, you know, and I don't think we're, you know, um, sort of, we are all speaking the same language in the sense, that universal language of peace, you know, there are all these kind of, you know, ideologies that, that are actually non-assigned, you know, to, to nations, you know. Peace obviously can be translated in different, con you know, into different peace and those basic kind of, um, um, I mean, what I call basic issues, you know, knowledge that we want as well, you know. They're not sort of assigned to the Western world only, but once we start taking ownership of ourselves first, which is obviously from the Fanonian and from the Satrian, kind of um, you know um, concept and that's why they obviously know that you can now overcome those kind of issues you know you don't go in talking about racism or class or you know um, or color because of our own sort of comfort you know or knowledge of our own of, of the culture in itself so that way you can actually now start struggling against your own rights you know those human rights and all the kind of um, rights that we, you know, we are all struggling against now as people in the world because of, of globalization. Everybody has to leave. We all have to now sort of fight for those rights. So where the united workers of the world can come together, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people misread, you know, where people like Corbyn, you know, are coming from. I know where he's coming from. We know he's red sat, you know, but he cannot go around quoting black obvious, you know, to people. So watering it down, but those of us who understand it, understand where he's coming from in that sense. But individual people need to be conscious of themselves first, you know, aware of themselves. Who are you? Where are you from? What is it that you want to know about yourself as a black man, as a white woman, as a, as a person of color, where you are able to stand anywhere in the global world without having to question yourself? And in those ways, your rights will never be imploded at all. Yeah. Can I just respond to the points yeah. the lady just raised? Uh, there are a lot of things, so points you raised, and I uh, think uh, for most of them, I think I, I disagree uh, with them. Uh, to begin with, we are all victims. Uh, when you say victims, we are all victims? Yeah, you say oh, we are all victims, black and white, we are all victims. Well, of the capitalist can world, I just, to a yeah, certain can extent. I just, can, I say, can I speak? Yeah. I have you had a say earlier on. Yeah. yeah. I wrote, you know, I, my brother here in the Migraine is from Colombia. Yeah. Uh, you can't say white people in Colombia are victims just as the Migraine is. You know, I, in the process of getting to America, the indigenous population has been decimated. This guy, Brzezinski, you know Brzezinski, the advisor to Obama, Jimmy Carter, yeah. he just wrote another article where he says, within five years of Christoph Columbus landing in the, in the Americas, 90% of the, of the, of the, of the uh, Haiti population was decimated. So you can say white people who are in America are just as victims as indigenous people in America. They're not. Well, I mean, I'm not. Let me just finish. You, you can walk in the United States for not for not for days, for years. You don't even see the indigenous of America whose land belongs to you. You don't see them. For years you walk in the US, you don't see them. You only see white people 
and of course you see Africans who have been drawn there uh, against the will. So you cannot say those indigenous people who survived the Americas who are living in the concentration camps in an awful condition with alcohol and uh, drugs, just inacceptable conditions in their own land are the same as white people in the Americas. Can you really, anyone in the world believe that? No. One is oppressed. And the white people there are part of the oppressor nations. They couldn't get there without participating in the oppression of the indigenous people. So that's what I say. I disagree with that. But, but, but can I finish my point? Because you, you made a lot of points. Is it okay if the speaker just finishes, then we'll relay, we will relay it back, don't and, uh, sure. You're saying uh, you're really pushing forward this individualism. I mean, there is no freedom as individuals unless you are Obama. Because Obama gets there at the expense of black people. He's all right with his family, just individualism. Basically, what they're trying to tell us, and I guess you say you're a lecturer, and I guess that's what maybe the role of lectures is, is to teach our youth, our children, individualism. Basically, success for you as an individual while your people are suffering. Now we say no. We say that's a fun is talking about. It's talking about collective success. First, then within collective success, you can shine according to your talent, things like that, as opposed to individual success and expense of, of the people. And uh, we just want to reiterate that our culture is a reflection of uh, that comes in a process of production. People produce real life. That's what the essence of life is. We produce life. That's what we're here for. If you don't produce life, you finish. In the process of producing life, you know, making tools, doing agriculture, things like that, we produce cultures. And to say culture comes first is wrong. And that's why we say the main contradiction in the world is the division between oppressor nations and oppressed nations. That is the main division in the world today between those who live on the less than the light day and those who are all right, you know, oppressor nation and oppressor nation. It's not uh, to say uh, reclaim your culture first. No, we say let get that freedom uh, first. Let achieve self determination first. If we achieve self determination, that's what we say the highest expression of democracy is self determination. When you're free, when you have power over, uh, when we have power over ourselves, we will produce a new culture. But if you get your culture and you're not free. If we, if we check that culture, it's going to be a culture of submission, submission. because you're not free at all, you know. And uh, there are other points, I think, uh, but this will be, uh, but for, for Sartre, Sartre is a member, he's intellectual. We appreciate Sartre uh, being uh, in support of the struggle, uh, you know, uh, against the colonization of Nigeria, other places like that. And, uh, but what we want, uh, not just white intellectuals, we want white people to do, Active solidarity for press people and starting with reparation. We want reparation for centuries of oppressions and theft and genocide. And I can't begin to describe what colonialism slavery did and continue to do. Because colonialism has not ended. As I'm talking to you, what, 10 million people have been killed in the Congo just to produce the cell phone you have? You don't see that in the news. I can tell you what, every night people are killed in the Congo just to terrorize the people because. All these companies, Apple, Microsoft, all of them, they get the content to make the computers almost free because we don't get paid in the Congo at all. You know, and that it's not just that. You go to Brazil, no, yesterday, today in Brazil, they kill indigenous in the forest, in their own land. You don't see that. People are celebrating Brazilian uh, Olympics. How many people have been killed in the favelas just to push them out to make these Olympics? How many? Have you seen the police going in the favelas where the indigenous and Africans live, killing them? No, yesterday. Now it's happening. <coughs> so okay. that, this, this, this is okay. something I, we need to talk about. Listen, I do understand all of this. My history as a political scientist, living in the United States and studying political science, and living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, across the Mississippi, I do get it. The history of oppression is also. Let us also, at the end of the day, look at this double standard. One side is, yes, basically the oppressor. But when we go back again and understand that word, even from Africa, where we also looked at the history, my own, and I don't want to be subjective, my own family were Brazilian slaves who had to take themselves back across into Nigeria. 
So I've gone double slavery, where we've had to come back. My, I'm third generation Brazilian back in Lagos. We look at that history and also till today understand why is it that Africans still today they don't want to start quoting all kinds of issues where places where Africans are now using the same structure that they have also inherited. Because at every given point, this is what we need to understand that nobody, no oppression can happen without the collaboration. And that's another issue in itself. The collaboration of our own people who are still continuously using because they want to maintain their own powers. How did the slaves come out of Africa in the first instance? Who allowed the who allowed or who even had that first conversations? Those are the kind of you know two-sided stories that we need to be looking at. I understand where you're coming from in terms of the history of oppression, but let us understand itself that a lot of people, and that's why Gore in Dakar, Ghana, those slave forts, people have apologized. A lot of countries even have now decided to reopen their own histories as well. I'm studying Senegal because at least Senegalese history and the Senegalese writers have opened up the arguments to say, it is time for us as black people to also understand the role that our own people played. If we do not understand that and we do not take ownership of the fact that we ourselves, till today, so we looked at slavery and when you look at the way slavery came on, it is a continuum. Slavery happened and as soon as slavery happened, the, the white men were not allowed at the beginning to go into the hinterlands. It was only about moving people. Okay, you, you, you know, you sell and for, for what? Black people were selling their own people deliberately and it's oppressing. Just a of okay, but well, that's what we are saying. Can I just finish? Can I just finish? Because at the end of the day, when you look at any kind of oppression, whether from the South Americans or from the Indian, from the Native Americans, somebody was talking. You cannot just go in because all you need is the consent. And who are the people they go to? The leaders. Leaders are the ones. We still become oppressed. Leaders will open their doors, even if it just means the handshake or the kind of, okay, come in and sit for two seconds. That is how the invasion happens. And that is when these people begin to hide under it and start blaming. We want some chance Okay, yes. I'm going to have to leave. But what I'm saying is that. No, 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 no. I'm going to have to go because. No, no, no. I'm saying something very relevant, but it's for everybody. You all know the history. No, no, no. You said we saw that one of the people and you want to go. Well, I said when I said we, I did not say. I said, look at the history. It's all obvious. Leaders. Who do they go to? Well, the archive are like there, the stories are there, stories, and when people, we have the story of point. oppression, you your point. We and we okay, also we have the story. You have to ask you to stop so the speakers sure. can respond for those yeah. that will stay. Uh, yeah. It's clear that her, and, and it's funny because that's exactly what we were talking about, and I, I don't think she was here for it, when we're talking about, she, you know, she's, she's trying to put the blame on ourselves, on colonized people themselves, and as, as Robert Louise has very accurately in his presentation said that, of course, yeah, we, we do, as anti-colonialists, we do put blame on the uh, petty bourgeoisie who are our own people. We have to, we do, and we have to struggle against that. But the structure itself was introduced, is maintained for the core centers of capitalism and imperialism, which are, of course, Europe and, and the United States, etc. Um, the thing about her saying that we, our people opened up, the, our leaders opened up, it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's like putting blame on ourselves, which I think is ridiculous. But anyway, uh, the, the thing about culture, and culture is very important. I, I do think culture is important, identity, etc., our history, etc. But it can't be our own individual culture and individual history. It has to be the collective history of our people. And we have to understand our culture and our history in order to fight the oppression. But we can't focus just on oppression, as the as the lady was saying. We can't just be 
talking about our identities and talking about our history, but not talking about the material, urge, very urgent conditions, material conditions of our people. As, uh, as the brothers rightly say, in Congo right now, people are dying because of the because of the uh, capitalist structure which exploit the people there and when they stand up to it or, or they fight back, they're killed for it. We can't, we can't fight back just through uh, becoming aware or conscious of our culture and history. Yes, that's important, but we, at the same time, we have to very urgently uh, fight the material conditions and, and that means we have to fight against imperialism and colonialism. Um, yeah, because... Uh you know, you can tell the sister she's uh, most of things she says is based on the uh, wide world view. You know, people have their own world view, and uh, the uh, thing about we Africans saw their own people is uh, something that you find in the British libraries and everything. You know, that's what they promote uh, among our people just to divide and everything. Um, I just give one task to all of us can we today, with certainty, say that Libyan people sold Libya? Because we saw uh, the uh, imperialists, they've invited and created themselves uh, the Transition Council of Libya. They gave them space and international recognition, and then they told them, you can invite us to bomb you. You understand? A minority of Libyan, it's exactly the same thing in Africa, all over the place. Like in Syria, you saw the, they were arming the Syrian Free Army, they were arming this and that. They will create an institution that will serve them. Just a couple of months ago, they created one thing in Belgium from Congo, the, the kind of a Syrian <coughs> council. Now they're going to invite them to bomb, you know, to bomb Congo. Within uh, we don't know when, but we know for a fact that what they do now, they create institution that will serve them in the short and long term, mm -hmm. and they put their own agent there. They say, oh, these people represent the, 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 the people of Syria or the people of uh, or Libya. Like today, uh, can we say the people who are running Libya today represent the people of Libya and they will? It's exactly the same thing in Africa. Uh, that's just one thing we should observe, you know, for modern days time, how, you know, invaders come to you. They, you know, they always weak people among any nation. They make sure they take the weaker one, take them, educate them, give them uh, recognition, money, training, everything, and then they use them. And uh, Sisi said she was from Nigeria and Ghana, right? She said she was out. Nigeria, Af Brazil, she Nigeria. Nigeria from Brazil. And, uh, she, uh, she mentioned Ghana, Ghana before. Well? Yeah, yeah, Ghana. yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she said Nigerian, though. Uh, that's her. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a place I was, uh, like, was it like eight years ago, uh, we went to Ghana. There's a place called Elmina Castle mm -hmm. in, in Ghana, in the coast of Ghana. And when you go to that place, the first thing that you see is the gunpowder that colonizers use, just like in Libya. They bomb you for a like couple of years or months or weeks, and then you come hands up and, you know, this is how they conquer people. They used to come in some places in Africa and bomb the people for months, literally bombing, just like in Libya. They had to bomb and they destroy the central leadership, and they put their own leadership at gunpoint. So this is, uh, you know, when Sisi said you saw your own people, there's no one single institution today in the world that can prove this is where the money, where, you know, African people put the money there when they saw their own people. But today we can go to see Barclays Bank, we can go and see Lloyds Bank, and you can Google Barclays and, and Lloyds of London. These people used to, you know, s uh, trade uh, slaves. They used to sell slaves. Where are the institutions where black people kept the money where they saw their own people? There's none you can't find in the modern days. But you surely can go in the streets of London and find Barclays and find Lloyds and find all kinds of things, all kinds of institutions in, the, in this uh, London where, you know, proofs of history that this is what UK imperialism has done to Africa. This is what they acquired. You can go to the America, you find institution or Brazil and stuff like that. So uh, like when... It's important because it, the way she was talking, and she was using past tense, mm -hmm. mm. as if in history, yeah, we, we were yeah. oppressed before. Yeah. But we're concerned in studying Fanon, we have to think about well, how we are oppressed now, like how it continues. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, the, sis, the the lady thought that seems from what she was saying that that's in the past. Like, yeah. it's, yeah. it's different. It's now. very much in the present. Um, do we have any? Yep, definitely. I just want to make a point about Syria. Uh, the previous point about what's happening in Syria being kind of divisive or whatever. Uh, 
I, I, I don't, I, like usually when it comes to this, it's like really difficult to convince people that FSA is not about, it's not some like extension of like Western imperialism in Syria. So I mean, if you maintain that belief, it's, I mean, I, I can't really say much, but you know, I live in Turkey, I live in Istanbul, and a lot of my friends have come from Syria, and a lot of them have escaped Syria because they were personally involved with that revolution. It is a revolution. And they were personally involved with that revolution and they have really suffered the consequences of being part of that revolution. And they're setting up their local councils. Like in Syria, really, uh, the opposition FSA is the closest that comes to the Syrian people's representation in Syria. This is why, for instance, like if we want to talk about like the intervention of Western imperialism in Syria, this is through Assad. This is through like Russians bombing them. This is through Assad like launching his barrel bombs over civilian grounds. The FSA are actually the, like there's this like narrative in Western media which tries to constantly complicate what's happening in Syria. Oh, we don't have any good guys. You know, everybody's crazy in Syria. They're all killing each other. Actually, we have like very easily identifiable good guys on Syria. Huh? The FSA. Yeah, yeah, the FSA. The FSA are actually. The FSA are huge entities that are obviously very much. Some are very independent, and others are very much influenced. Absolutely. I don't think it's fair and representative to say that the FSA are entirely imperialist, but at the same time, because they are, it's a huge branch. It's very, you know, it's got it's lots very of different kind of, groups. Exactly, it's not a, a, a holistic entity, no. um, but at the same time, you cannot deny that the imperialists have an interest in destabilizing the region. They very much played into destabilizing the region. And I mean, um, I don't know where we're gonna go with Syria, with Erdogan's talk, with Putin and, and so on. Yes. But let's have that talk later, inshallah. Um, but no, I just wanted to open a parenthesis in there to just make sure yeah, that yeah, it's Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that, obviously. But at the same time, we do need to recognize that there are like, you know, a lot of imperialist um, interest in destabilizing the region. And Assad, um, yeah, fair enough. Um, um, he's been complicit. Um, he was at 10 Downing Street shaking Blair's hand a few years ago, and now he's sort of the enemy and so on. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, there's a, it's very, very complicated. I mean, if you want to comment on it, you know. I just want to briefly comment on the situation in the Middle East. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite clear that uh, the US is involved in the Middle East. And the US agenda is quite clear, it's the agenda of oppression. That's the US agenda. Uh, it's also clear that uh, the, uh, the conflicts uh, in, uh, in the Middle East uh, has something to do also with the division of the Middle East by the British and the French. They are the ones who created what is Syria, what is Kuwait, what is Iraq, and uh, they did so to forward their own interests. They didn't they didn't do that uh, for the interest of uh, the people of the Middle East. There is no doubt that uh, Assad uh, is uh, uh, an oppressor, but uh, the problem is the people uh, of a so-called the uh, free, freedom, Syrian. Uh, free Syrian uh, army. What is their agenda? Uh, is it the agenda against uh, uh, against no? Is the agenda against uh, Israel settlers Israel? Is that the agenda? Is the agenda to get rid of the, of the U.S. imperialism uh, in the region? Is that the agenda? No, but but uh, to fight against Assad. But to what's, what's end? What about the main contradiction in the region? The main contradiction in the region is not Assad. The main contradiction in the region is the U.S. imperialist domination through Israel, settler colonial uh, state, which is uh, basically uh, uh, a military uh, post for for the U.S. imperialism. You can't ignore that. You know, think, there is no way. You... And I think it's important yeah. it, um, when we're talking about Fanon, yeah. mm. and he and he talks about you can't you can't understand the situation in a particular region without thinking about the broad, oh, about yeah, the global yeah. structure. So and it, and if we look at the global structure, there's no doubt that uh, European and U.S. imperialism are the main oppressors everywhere in the world. And the beneficiaries. And the beneficiaries, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And Just so people like Assad and, and other elites, yeah. people like Assad and other elites in those regions yeah. do benefit, yeah. do benefit yeah. from that structure, but they're not, they're not like, 
They're not the main players. They're yeah. not the main players in the, in the, in the... Yeah, definitely. And if you see who supports the, uh, the First Indian Army, uh, you look at the Saudi, you look at the Qatari, they don't have the general freedom for the people of, uh, of the region. They're the ones who have, uh, uh, who are basically Nick cooperating. Nick Palestine as well, so... Yeah, but uh, at the same time, you could look at the uh, long-term agenda. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in bed with uh, settler Israel, is that right? So yeah. you can't deny that. So basically, I don't believe, uh, although I do uh, work on the crisis in the region, because when there's a crisis, it means the parents can't rule as, uh, they can't rule in the same old ways. It gives oppressed people opportunities. But the struggle in that place must recognize that Israel state has to go, the US empire must go, imperialism out of the region. And the sellouts, all these monarch regimes, the Middle East have to go. So if the struggle is, is if this is what the people in Syria are saying, and other people are saying also, and the borders imposed on them, because they want people. You know, if they're calling for all that, that, that would make sense. Not doing what they've been doing so far. As you say, one point with yeah, you, regarding the, uh, the uh, Americas and Africa. People need to realize this. When you went to Africa or went to America, there was no what you call permanent state for warfare. There wasn't. And this explains the facilities Europe uh, was able to come to Africa and also go to America because they didn't have to face, because people in America, in Africa, generally speaking, these were sophisticated community. You know, you had cities built on lake in Mexico. That's advanced, that's advanced technology. You know, and our people in America is, you know, uh, they had no word for lies. Can you see a society where women were not oppressed? Where the word lies, you know, telling lies didn't exist? That's an advanced society. That's a real communism or socialism, so to speak, that uh, Karl Marx and, uh, and the others were inspired uh, by the work of, uh, of Morgan. So we're talking about advanced societies as opposed to lies, you know, that professor just uh, gave us. Because basically, what he's say, what he's saying, basically, what happened to your press people is because of the yeah, yeah. No, it's not that because we did not need to have a permanent state for killing, for war, or raping. Mm. We didn't need it because we didn't need it when European came. That worked in their favor, but we know better now. We have to organize because we need to have power. You know, when your press people are fighting, they're not fighting just to change the culture. They have to fight for power, self determination. When you have power and self determination you can do what you want to do for your culture. So just the point yeah. of, just to conclude now, so um, the, uh, with respect to, I mean, even like the Syrian um, crisis, this could relate. So disunity, obviously it's in our interest for these petty bourgeoisie like Assad and other beneficiary sort of people who are, you know, the, the second beneficiary, second tier beneficiaries, they need to go, you know, we don't want them there. But at the same time, we have no unity in Assyria, right? So if you want to replace it, um, you, you can't because unity, there is no actual structure, there's no organization. So what we advocate is, well, I'm not speaking for anybody, but I advocate that you first organize, there needs to be some un unity, there needs to be um, all the sort of representatives of the nation state um, in order to, to replace. Um, Nadia, I forgot one thing. You see, this question of Syria is very important. It just reminds me of Zimbabwe with, uh, mm. with uh, Mugabe. Yes. We, we are clear. We say if US or France attack Syria, we say victory to Syria. We never side with imperialism. Mm. We never, 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 never ever side with imperialism. Because imperialism is the enemy for all people on the planet, including the Syria government. It's, it's just, we are just clear on that. But when it comes to the Syrian state with the people, the workers, we side with the people. But when it comes to imperialism, we say defeat imperialism, defeat the people of Syria, defeat the people of Afghanistan. Regardless of who is in Afghanistan, we understand if British imperialism defeats in Afghanistan, US defeated in Afghanistan, it gives all people, on the planet, all the oppressed people on the planet, possibilities also to win. Because if we can win Afghanistan, we can win everywhere. Yeah. This does not lead to the contradictions, but we are all the time to recognize the main contradiction, and the main contradiction is imperialism, white imperialism. Mm -hmm.
he has to go. And don't destroy um, some an infrastructure if you don't have anything better to replace it with is basically what I kind of concluded with some of Fanon's work, you know. And of course, like I said, um, in no way, shape or form endorsing like tyrants um, that oppress our own people. But like I said, if you don't have anything better to replace it with, then it creates far more insurgency and we're imploding from within and more of our own people are dying um, and, and we see more bloodshed as a result. Whereas, um, you know, uh, a fair few years ago, um, we were seeing stability and education flourishing in that region. Um, so yeah, um, I would like to thank you so much, both our speakers, it's Brother Lazy and uh, Brother Nema Ken. Uh, we hope to see you um, hopefully again, and we want to invite you and, no and um, got, have that kind of dialogue on a bigger scale. Unfortunately, there were a fair few people who really wanted to be here um, that um, had other engagements because we're quite a weekly. It's quite it's quite a big commitment on a weekly basis, you know. So some from time to time um, people can't make it, but. Um, again, thank you so much um, and we really appreciate everybody else coming and their contributions. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.